evening, everybody. Thanks a lot for coming out tonight. My name is Jeff Lee, and I'm the director of the Rocky Mountain Land Library. And on behalf of the Land Library and the Tattered Cover Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Land Series program. The Land Series will continue tomorrow at 2 o'clock as William Philpott presents a slide talk based on his new book, Vacation Land, Tourism and the Environment in Colorado's High Country. And we have many more land series programs coming up this fall, so please help yourself to the information on the back table, where we also have an email sign-up sheet if you'd like to receive series updates. Tonight, we're very happy to welcome Kay Ann Short, author of A Bushel's Worth, an Ecobiography, a wonderfully written book that calls on Kay Ann's memories of her family's farm in North Dakota, along with her current day experiences at Stonebridge Farm, her 10-acre community-supported farm in Longmont. Author Hannah Nordhaus had this to say about tonight's book. A heartfelt meditation on farm, food, and family. A bushel's worth tells a love story of the land and a life spent caring for it. Please join me in welcoming Kay Ann Short. Vegetables for our members. 
Um, I'm going to read a little bit. I want to just do a little reading of, about what community means to us today. This is from a chapter called Toppings to Share, which is about our annual pancake breakfast. But everything that I'm going to say is also so true of what our community is going through right now with the flood and the recovery from the flood. In this country's rural history, agricultural communities were dependent on sharing and cooperation. Events like barn raisings and grain threshing were communal events where neighborhoods, where neighbors helped each other. Um, they borrowed each other's tools, horses, and machinery. They met for quilting bees, butchering, and food preserving. After the work was done, someone brought out a fiddle and they danced and sang together. The Little House Books by Laura Ingalls Wilder, on which I was raised, have delighted generations of readers with heartwarming stories of a time when the fate of families and neighbors were joined by their common need for food, shelter, and companionship. In the highly individualized consumer culture of the U.S. today, sharing is a custom we rarely practice. Sharing is inconvenient. We want things when we want them, not later. John says that moving is the last vestige of cooperation in our culture. We help each other pack, lift, load, haul, unload, and unpack again. But after the work of moving is done, we're on our own. As consumers, we're supposed to purchase all the tools, technology, and goods we need for ourselves, rather than own them communally. We buy what we need rather than borrow it. That way, we don't have to be responsible for returning it. On the other hand, we hesitate to lend things because we're afraid we won't get them back. It's the ethics of sharing we've lost as much as the practice. An ethics that says we can cooperate on fulfilling our needs if we respect that one person's need is as important as the others. Since Stonebridge is a share the harvest farm, in which the weekly distribution is based on the bounty of the field rather than the market value of the vegetables. Our members share exactly what's ready to harvest that week. By August, when the high summer vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, squash, and eggplant are booming, members will need many bags to carry it all home. They also experience the diversity and seasonality of foods that grow in our region, from vegetables to fruit to herbs, and can expect something new each time they come to the barn to pick up their share. This idea of sharing extends to our pancake breakfast as well. Toppings to share is a concept John and I think a lot about at Stonebridge. To us, it means encouraging relationships in ways that build community. The phrase itself comes from our pancake breakfast. When we send around an email to the members or write an announcement for the event on our barn chalkboard, we always include the phrase, toppings to share. That's because in one of our earliest years, we failed to specify that people should bring pancake toppings to eat communally. Instead, we wrote something like, bring whatever toppings you eat at home. People interpreted that to mean, only bring enough toppings for yourself. So they brought half a banana, or a tiny container of yogurt, or an almost empty jar of peanut butter. That was a terrible pancake breakfast. <laughs> we learned at that, pan at that breakfast that if we mean to share, we need to say it. If the meal is communal will benefit from everyone's participation, it's up to us to make that intention perfectly clear. At the very next farm event, the annual Halloween party on the last Saturday of the season, we spelled it out. Bring finger foods to share, and everyone did. Our members have always appreciated nature's bounty. They know that a share the harvest farm also means that what we get is what we get. If the zucchini fails, which has unimaginably happened, no one gets zucchini. If hail ruins our crops, and I have to say here I have written, that hasn't happened yet, but in fact, this season, for the first time, we did lose some crops to hail. So I can't happen. The shares may be minimal that season. We offer no promise, no guarantee, no money back. Lucky for 
for us, we may have had less than conducive conditions or a crop failure for certain vegetables. And here I am written, we've never had to shut down the barn. But in fact, this year, we did when we were flooded out the highway in front of us. And not only that, our farm was part of a restricted access zone. And so this was two weeks ago. So our members could not get to the barn to get their vegetables two weeks ago. So it's been a difficult season. But other than that, and, and we were open last Saturday, and we'll be tomorrow. Other than that, um, our members trust us to do the best we can. And they're always happy to help, whether the problem be too much or too little. Members, in the truest sense of belonging, they offer encouragement for our efforts in the fields. Like this poem of magnet words I found on our barn fridge that said, Yes, go farmer, please homegrown, many better legendary harvests, always. We need organic love, good hope. When seeds scatter in the wind, they go a little further afield. When humans practice generosity, they go a little further too. The best sharing is when we give like nature does freely and without expectation of return. We forget sometimes this ethic of sharing unless the seeds fall where they will. Like topics to share, we all need a reminder from time to time that when we bring the best we have to the table, our sharing is the real reward. what parts of the book to read. And with um, a bushel's board, I cover such a variety of topics. There's farming, there's eating and cooking, and you know, we all love to read about that. And there's music and literature and women's roles and community. Um, but there's also a lot of different voices that I use in this book. I'm often didactic because I have to confess I was a teacher for a long, long time. And you can't ever get out of that role. Um, but sometimes I'm literary, I'm often nostalgic for my grandparents' farms in particular, sometimes contemplative, and even political. So I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about how I started with the book. Um, its original title was Farm Giving, because I was, I was really focusing on this idea of, of bounty and, and sharing. Um, and it was going to be 12 chapters, three for each season, and kind of following the chronology of the farm. But while I was writing the book, I also started a blog called Pearl and Plenty. And that was really just for writing practice. Didn't have any particular aim except to give myself a place to write. And as I was writing Pearl and Plenty, all these stories of our childhoods, I say our childhoods because my siblings are here, um, on our grandparents' farms kept popping into you know, my, my head. And so I decided that those stories really needed to go into the book, too. It made it a richer book. But it also allowed me to draw connections between the, those, that old time farming, I guess family farming, and the small scale farms today. So I'd like to read a chapter called Marking Her Days with Grace. This is based on my grandma Smith's diary. I have a few of her diaries. I don't have them all. I have a few of them. It's about my grandma Smith, but it's also about my grandma Short, because they both were really incredibly strong women. You had to be strong to live on the North Dakota prairie in those days. In my grandma Smith's diaries, each sparse entry starts with a weather report. A true farmer, she always recorded the weather, both the high and low temperatures, and noteworthy conditions, like sheer wind or a blinding snowstorm. Farmers depend on the weather, so marking its changes helped her remember the years. But in rural North Dakota, the weather meant something more. It determined the possibilities of each moment and the strength needed to endure the extremes of life on prairie. Some days in July, she would just write, hot. Another series of weather entries in 1966 reads like a poem. Wednesday, March 9th, 45 degrees above, snow melting, just like spring. Thursday, March 10th, no need for a weather report. Friday, March 11th, 
Weather is fine. My favorite weather entry reads, Saturday, January 29, 1966. This morning, it's 40 below, so it won't be very warm today. <laughs> Even in a North Dakota winter, that could be considered an understatement. In my grandmother's make-do world, won't be very warm means won't be going anywhere today. My grandparents lived in the country, so snowstorms meant no trips to town and no visitors dropping by until the weather cleared. I can imagine my grandmother watching the wide winter gray sky from the kitchen window while she baked her weekly loaves of bread. She was a slim woman who in her later years never <coughs> seemed to get warm. For her last Christmas, we gave her a heavy Scandinavian sweater to take away the chill. After she died, I inherited that sweater, but I have never worn it. I don't want to lose the smell of her face powder in that heavy wool. Winter in North Dakota is unforgiving. An incautious mistake, an empty fuel tank, turning down the wrong dirt road, bad tires, can mean death in a blizzard that shrouds the prairie in macy white. And winter stays into spring there, as my grandmother's diary confirms. Friday, March 4th, 1966. 12 degrees above high for today. It's nice here today, but not so warm. It's close to zero. We were lucky to miss being in the storm the last three days. Some lives lost in South Dakota. I baked a pie. Here on the next page, my grandmother tucked two newspaper clippings about that day's old storm. Snow's wrath on our path, exclaims one. Holy cow, no snow plow, warns another. Luckily, my grandparents missed that blizzard, and they got to town so my cousin could try on the, dri the dress of tissue gingham that our grandmother had made for her. But my grandmother admits again in her understated way. The wind was so howling, I didn't like it. With those words, I could see her watching the sky for snow and waiting for the roads to clear so she could venture into town to visit family and buy supplies, perhaps even some fabric for my Easter dress in Colorado. Rereading my Grandma Smith's diaries, I look for clues about how she spent her days. She sewed continually, and she baked a lot of bread six or seven loaves at a time. She kept her flour in a deep pull-out bin in the kitchen cabinet that held a 50-pound bag. She would bake once a week, making enough for morning toast, noon sandwiches, and evening bread and butter. Covered by thin cotton dish towels and boarded with vegetable people or sunbonnet girls, the loaves rose high in their pans. Sometimes she makes cinnamon rolls along with the bread letting the grandchildren roll out the rectangle of dough and spread it with real butter from our uncle's creamery. Then we would spoon on with brown sugar and sprinkle the dough with cinnamon, roll it up tight, pitch the seam, slice it into a dozen thick rounds, and pack them carefully in the cake pan to rise. Fresh and hot from the oven, the sugar and butter filled rolls melted on our fingers and tongues. No store bottom, as they used to say, cinnamon rolls could ever taste that good. Grandma Smith worked hard on the farm, even after she, she and my grandfather weren't raising animals and crops anymore. A typical entry of her busy life reads. Tuesday, February 11, 1966. I baked two apple pies, put in freezer, scrubbed the kitchen floor, fed the cats at the barn, burned the paper. This PM, I'm going out visiting. I remember my grandmother down on her hands and knees, scrubbing the floor in case someone stopped by. I marveled that she wore dresses around the house with her old pantyhose, not wanting to waste a brand new pair. When I asked her why she didn't just go bare naked, she exclaimed in disapproval, no, I can't do that. <laughs> she was fashionable her entire life, even when scrubbing the floor. Because the Smith farm was on the highway in the Williston the county seat, many of my grandparents' farming friends Party friends and relatives would stop by unannounced for coffee on their way to or from town. In her diary,
diaries, Grandma Smith noted who had visited that day and what she had baked. Lemon meringue pie, angel food cake, and a kind of date cookie she called matrimonial chews. Now we don't know what they're called that because dates lead to matrimony, <laughs> or they were kind of sticky like marriage. <laughs> Visitors were so common at the farm, the one entry comments on not receiving guests. Saturday, March 9, 1985, I was home all day, baked a pie, but no company. My grandmother rarely noted her feelings or reflections about her life. But one of the few reflective passages she wrote makes me laugh. Tuesday, January 25, 1966. I'm cleaning the basement. And it sure looks better. <laughs> that sure sounds just <clears throat> like her. A mix of practicality and positive thinking. If you're going to do something, it seems to say, do it right and be happy you've done it. Why weren't her diaries more personal, more revealing of her thoughts and feelings? I don't think she worried about someone discovering them. After her death, we found these few diaries stuck in an old cabinet in the basement more tucked away for safekeeping than him. I think instead that she didn't feel a need to express personal feelings in diary form. What was important was recording the everyday events of her life, keeping track of the weather and the visitors, the comings and goings of a farm on the edge of town. In a few entries, though, I catch a glimpse of the more private side of my grandmother, moments of the solace she found in the natural world. In her diary, she would note signs of the seasons changing, especially when a long, cold winter was turning away for spring. Wednesday, April 6, 1983. We walked to the creek and found mayflowers and heard a meadow lark sing. Tuesday, April 12, 1983. No snow yet. Cleaned house. Saw a meadow lark today. Gophers are running around and also saw a pheasant and two rabbits. In entries like these, I imagine her looking out the window over the prairie. Although prairie is my word, not hers, she would say pasture, since the long grass is where my grandparents graze their cow. I picture her walking to the creek, which she pronounced creek, to look for mayflowers, grateful for a sign of spring, that spring had finally made its way to the north, she paid attention to the creatures around her because they inhabited the same piece of land. She marked her days by the weather and the seasons because they formed the backdrop of her life on the farm, determining each day's possibilities. These diary entries reveal an intimacy with nature that seems a private part of my grandmother's life, quiet moments of grace in the midst of her busy days. I had written, raining for three hours, too muddy to work in the morning. I'm happy for the rain. <laughs> Little did I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our farm is 22 seasons old. That makes us pretty much the grandparents of CSA. Um, we think we've got vegetable growing down to a pretty good extent. So our next, our next challenge really is figuring out how to keep our farm a farm, given all the changes that are going on around us. For now, we're just hunkering down and staying put. I mean, even when those flood you know, levels were rising, we had packed a backpack each, and we knew we could walk out to higher ground, but we were determined we were not going to leave unless we absolutely had to, because we were afraid we wouldn't get back in, and then we didn't know what would, what would happen. Um, so yeah, we're staying put for now, and our community is a really big part of that. I just feel like farmland preservation is getting even more urgent. I mean, it's been urgent for quite a long time. In the 70s and the 80s, we were hearing about farmland. Um, but, but today, even more so. So I want to read a little bit from a couple chapters. One is called The Lay of the Land, and the other is called And the Earth.
Earth gives again. And this gives a sense of how we think about the land at Stonebridge as what I call cultivated space. Right. Running through the soil on our farm is a complex structure of prairie rhizome grass with roots up to 10 feet deep. Of all the plants that live at Stonebridge, prairie grass is the plant that most divine, defines Stonebridge for me, which may seem odd since it's not a crop we intentionally grow. Yet whenever we cultivate flowers, herbs, vegetables, or fruits, we uncover a vast web of fibrous grass roots as deep as we can dig, deeper than we could ever dig, really. One species in particular, Bromus inertus, commonly called smooth grown grass, is a tall prairie grass that likes to invade my perennial beds, its slender stalk arching from the weight of seed heads bronzed in the July heat. Smooth brome was introduced from England in the 1880s. Although I often curse the invasive nature of this non-native species, I can't help admire its persistence in inhabiting our arid region. From rhizome grass, I've learned that the true meaning of grassroots is found below the surface in the tenacious weaving of many into one. We may manage to clear out grass on the surface of the garden, but that interwoven root structure will survive, sending out new blades one day when we've got our backs turned. As I'm digging roots out of the soil as deeply as I can, I think of Thoreau in Walden, who wrote that he was making the earth say beans instead of grass. <laughs> Thoreau got it right. No matter how much I did, I know I got the work. Stonebridge's entire 10 acres surely would return to prairie grass within a year if we stopped farming here. Sometimes that's a comforting thought, one that thumbs its nose at all things human. But if this land doesn't continue to be farmed, it could follow the development pattern along our highway corridor, becoming a subdivision or an atrocious strip mall. We'll do what we can to prevent that. As farmers, John and I are committed to keeping our land in agricultural production by remaining rural rather than annexing to the nearby city. We hope to continue growing food for our community for decades to come, but if we can't farm here, the grass reassures me that all will be well. Better to return the land to prairie than cover it with asphalt. When I think of our work at Stonebridge, I think of the word cultivate, whose root word cult came from the Indo-European quell or qua, meaning to turn. Turning carries both the sense of turning or cultivating the soil and the cycles of the seasons turning. A culture originally meant a piece of tilled land. The sense of the word culture, meaning human customs, came after the word cultivate, as in tending the soil for crops. The concept of growing food then was prior to the concept of social practices. Or perhaps it was the first practice conceptualized as culture. No wonder we celebrate food as one of the primary characteristics of defining diverse cultures today. The agri part of the word agriculture comes from the Latin agir, or field, originally meaning untended land. Agra is related to the word acre, which by the Norman conquest in 1066 was defined as, I love this, as the area that a yoke of oxen could plow in one day. That's what an acre was originally. And today it's the equivalent of 43,560 square feet in the United States, or 0.4 hectares in metric terms. Whether defining tended or untended land, agro is not just a measurement, but it also carries the sense of soil and the rural or agrarian practices that revolve around that soil. These derivations are important because combined in the word agriculture, they reveal the development of human existence through interaction with the land that has sustained our survival as a species. This vital yet vulnerable collaboration means that agriculture inhabits a mediated place, 
in the Earth's existence, a cultivated space somewhere between, between untended wild wildness and urbanized civilization. On a farm, cultivated space is neither wild nor civilized, but something in between. Cultivation is where humans and wilderness converge to form a fertile alliance. Here the soil is tilled by humans with their tools and planted in an orderly fashion for the production of food. Once cultivated, the farm must depend on the elements, wind, water, sun, to provide factors that humans still cannot. In cultivation, we plant in rows as the cycle of the seasons turn, and lines and circles draw themselves around us once again. The ditches at Stonebridge, too, are cultivated spaces, despite their resemblance to wilderness. And I like to say, we have three ditches. The one in the middle is called the Rough and Ready, and it's named after the two horses that dug out, that plowed out that ditch, Rough and Ready, the horses <clears throat> In their riparian ecosystem, they seem almost wild. Lush with grasses, cottonwood, snakes, owls, herons, and muskrats. It's easy to forget that the ditches were dug by humans with domesticated animals and plows, cultivated in their own way for the benefit of agriculture and of people who needed food. Now, even less waterborne animals use the ditches for travel. We have bears, raccoons, coyotes, deer, elk, and even bobcat, making their way along the paths created by water and trees. And last Sunday, this is, you know, a week after the flood, we had an immense turtle, like a foot and a half long, that came out of the ditch and was just sitting under a tree where we have a, a swing, just sitting under there. I hope it's gone back, found its way back to the river, or maybe it was living in, you know, living on our land all this time. We don't know. That was a really cool surprise. A farm may be as close to wilderness as some people ever get, but it's not wild. Rather, a farm is a place where the natural and human worlds must live as harmoniously as we can manage. In Plant Dreaming Deep, May Sarton writes, one cannot impose one's will upon a garden. Something has already been imposed, the terrain itself, the landscape on which it is to be created. The same is true of the farm. We must always work with what was here first, the lay of the land and all its inhabitants. When I complained one day about mice and rats getting into every corner of the farm and the vigilance necessitated by their constant presence, John teased, well, I guess you can move to the city. But I don't want to do that. Instead, I'll live alongside all the creatures here as best I can. This is their home too. And undoubtedly, my presence is no less inconvenient to them as theirs is to me. We have enough at Stonebridge, enough space, enough water, enough food, enough care for all of us. From our privilege in owning this land comes the responsibility to use it wisely, not just for ourselves, but for every living being found here. On this sphere, in these lines, we must learn to exist in plentitude together. Lovely book, but the farm thing 
it over. It's over. <laughs> and, um, I even had one agent, bless her heart, and she took the time to do this. She said, I went down to my local bookstore, and there's already a whole shelf, a whole shelf of books about farming. So, in other words, you know, that's enough. But um, I, I'm a big believer that you should write the book that you want to see in the world. So I kept going, and I found Tory House. And, and, you know, there's wonderful farm books out there, but a common theme in a lot of those books are city folk escaping city ways. Um, you know, it's a great theme, but that is not what this is book about. This is much more about a reunion, I like to say, with my grandparents' farming past. So, um, you know, support Tory House and support these wonderful independent bookstores like we have here with Tatter Cover. We're so lucky. Yes. G-I-O-N, not Parisian. <laughs> but um, you can eat them, of course, you can throw them into a stew, but you can also plant them. They're an heirloom bee. So I invite you to take a little bit of Stonebridge home with you tonight. Plant them, tend them, they'll give you dry beans. You can know, let the pus dry out, and then you can make a whole soup for yourself. So in ending, I want to read a passage in a chapter called What Goes Down. It's a chapter about a tree at Stonebridge, but it's also about my yoga practice and the lessons I've learned from my teacher, Lisa Lamoche. It's really about helping me find balance in my life, which is not always easy to do these days, <coughs> and also about accepting the inevitability of change. What Goes Down. For years, we dreaded the death of the venerable cottonwood that cast its meandering limbs across our irrigation ditch to the flower garden on the other side. Rooted on one bank, its trunk leaned nearly horizontal over the other, as if to form a bridge between them. The trunk itself spanned 15 feet in diameter and was covered with a bark ridged a hand's width deep. Our arborist friend said such thick bark grew only on the oldest variety of cottonwood here in Colorado's front range, making our tree over 100 years old, following the digging of the rough and ready ditch in the 1860s, 50 years before our farm was established. Standing upright, the cottonwood would have been the tallest tree on our farm, but as the tree aged, the weight of the boughs began to pull the roots from the eroding bank below leaving less root structure each year to anchor the tree along the ditch's edge. The more the cottonwood leaned, the less water and nutrients could enter its system. And as the trunk, um, and as the trunk rotted from the inside out, weakening the tree's ability to feed itself. As the cycle continued over the years, we watched the cottonwood tip closer and closer to the flower garden below. But amid its decay, the tree was full of life. Birds sang, nested above, while squirrels chased their mates below. Raccoons ran up and down the hollow space inside the trunk, emerging on upper branches from rotted <coughs> knot holes. Once I saw four baby raccoons perched along the limb, far above my head. When I returned with a friend, five babies stared curiously at us from the bow. When we came back with yet another friend, six, Vast faces looked down as if to say, see, they're multiplying. Despite such signs of life, we still couldn't deny that the tree was dying. When the hard winds blew in the spring, long branches fell into the flower garden into the raspberry patch, some big enough to worry about. We were tired of picking up deadfall, but removing the tree wasn't possible either, not without considerable expense and time to clear the remains. To help lessen the weight on the tree's remaining roots, we hired our arborist friend one day to trim larger boughs from the tree's north side where they seemed to hang more heavily. We thought that easing that side would help rebalance the tree.
tree and strengthen the remaining roots in the ditch. He pruned as much from the tree as he dared, but he feared that taking too much would leave too little for the tree's survival. Such pruning, we hoped, would extend the tree's life for years. May winds blow hard along the front range, hard enough to topple motorhomes, overturn trailers, and push cars off the highway. Hard enough to blow water towers across the plains, hard enough to worry about. Three nights after the pruning, the wind howled and shook the house, but it didn't occur to us to worry about the tree. It had just been pruned for one, and its mass still seemed indomitable. Farm roofs, yes, and the chicken house, yes, but that tree didn't even cross our minds as we listened to the wind shake the world. In the morning, John went out to check for damage on the farm while I made a pot of tea. When he came in the kitchen door, I could see from his face that something had happened. I've got some bad news, he said, but his next words surprised me. It's the tree. And I'm going to stop. <laughs> Perfect timing. We have about 15 minutes for question and answers. You can ask me what the juiciest part of the book is, if you like, or anything really about the farm, about the book, or about writing, or about the flood. How um, you mentioned the prairie grass right. having roots 10 feet deep, up to 10 yeah. feet deep. Um, that made me think of the flood and how something like that could really hold the soil, I imagine. I understand when yeah. Hurricane I being hit Vermont, a lot of the, they lost a lot of topsoil, right. a lot of the toxic debris got washed right. down, but yeah. there can be this bioremediation through prairie grass and good yeah. farming approaches. Absolutely, you know, since uh, what were called the dirty 30s, you know, during the Depression, when we had lost so much soil because too much was being plowed and not enough was being left in terms of trees or grasses to stop the soil from eroding when we got these incredible winds that, you know, were just tormenting the area. And so we learned something then about soil conservation. But we're, we've moved away from that a little now too. You know, corn is so is such a valuable crop these days that there's land that's being um, torn up really for to grow corn on in places you know in the Midwest especially that nothing really should be growing except for these borders that will help um, keep the soil in, keep it from eroding. So that was our biggest fear as we stood, you know, watching the river on one side and hearing the ditches on the other side. Wow, you know, if these go over any of them, because we have three ditches, including a highland, which is, you know, fairly high. If that came down, it could just wash out all of our fields, all of our crops. And truthfully, at the time, it didn't, what was probably even a worse problem, it didn't even occur to us, and that was the contamination of the water itself which is going to be a huge problem for farms, especially you know, east of us. So when, when the water finally, when the rain finally stopped, and we knew that Button Rock Dam was not going to blow, because that was you know, a rumor that was circulating. If it had, certainly the river would have come up all the way to our farmhouse and flooded the house as well. Um, when we knew that we were going to be OK, and we walked back to see how the crops were doing, Nothing, you know, just the rainwater, no flooding at all. I can't tell you how relieved we were, were we? <laughs> and even then, from that, from so much rainwater, the soil was kind of soggy. I never felt it quite that soft before. It was kind of like walking on bread that was rising. It was kind of an incredible feeling. But yeah, thank heavens we have so much. I mean, we have our pasture grass and we have these riparian areas along the ditches to help us if something you know, happens a bit like that should happen. So, I don't know, maybe this play will help us you know, get back to those ideas of soil conservation. I certainly hope so. Yeah. You mentioned the heirloom seeds. Do you have heirloom plants for your CSA as well and a seed exchange? And 
We do. We grow as many heirloom varieties as we can, and we save as many heirloom varieties. That's why, if you came to our house right now, and you looked at our kitchen table, it would be covered with all these little bowls full of seeds, because that's, you know, where I'm saying that we had a friend we invited him to say for lunch um, yesterday because he's kind of up in the mountains and you know all by himself. And we invited him to stay for lunch. And I said, "Excuse all these bowls, <laughs> seeds." And he said, "Oh, I thought you just hadn't done your breakfast dishes yet." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it's really important to use those those seeds. And I'll give a shout out to the Fedco Seed Company, which is in Maine, because they don't um, have any dealings with any. Um, GMO seed producers, so you know that's a that can be a hard way to go, but um, they're doing doing a great job of it. But it's very important these days. Kia, yeah. yes. What else goes on at Sunbridge Farm? Oh, thank you for asking that. <coughs> uh, we have an old time music jam once a month. <laughs> Wonderful people who come out for that. I write a little bit that in the book. We um, host a digital storytelling uh, full week-long workshop. Daniel Whitechaker is here representing the Center for Digital Storytelling and that's been a, just a really enriching part of what we do at the farm. Um, if you go to either Wishelsworth website or our Stonebridge Farm CSA website, you'll see some digital stories that I've made about the farm. Um, we also, I talk about in the book about we just renovated an old granary that we brought down the highway and uh, we renovated that for writers' retreats. So if you're a writer, I, I want you to look into that and love to have you on the farm. We're kind of thinking about the future. You know, we're going to continue, of course, to grow vegetables, but in terms of keeping a farm a farm, economically, but also in terms of community, in terms of sharing what we have here, we feel it's just really um, a refuge, I guess. People often say that when they come to the farm. It just feels like a refuge. And you don't have to go very far from the city, actually, to find it. We're right on Highway 66. You know, but you just walk back a little ways and it feels like a different place. So all kinds of things like that, you know. We've got five weeks left of our season, so pretty soon we'll have our Halloween and end of season party when kids play. Donut on a string, and uh, it's kind of crazy because here we're this organic farm, but we have kids who are um, we dangle these toxic, you know, white powder sugar donuts. <laughs> they get all the over their faces, and it's really really fun. So yeah, it's really about community. It's too much. So what's going to happen to the farm, and especially like considering what you were just talking about? accepting the inevitability of change. Right. How, how do you wrestle with like wanting to preserve this place but then also being open for it to change, or not being open right. for it? Right. It's change. really hard to think of us not being there. But then when I think back, you know, the people who established Stonebridge, it was originally a dairy farm. It's been organic as far as we know, as far as we can trace. You know, they're not there anymore. And the farm goes on. So, Someday we won't be there, and the farm will go on. We do have a wonderful little grandson, so maybe he'll want a farm, but we're not going to push it. We're not going to push it. <laughs> Just because I keep buying overall <laughs> does not mean he has to be a farmer. You know? But we feel like, I mean, just like with us, it was maybe serendipitous John and Rachel came to the farm, and then when the people who owned it were ready to move on, you know, they, they knew that. They would be good people. In fact, two years ago, the owner that we purchased the farm from came out. He's back in Nebraska now, his family farm, but came out and walked them all over the whole farm. Of course, he said, you know, a man a few words, and we got back to the house, and he just looked at us and he said, I think it turned out okay. <laughs> so, sure. <laughs> That's good because. Um, so, I don't know, but I think that we've already taken some measures, in fact, with our town board in Lyons, talked with, you know, some county people about conservancy, or we are um, designated rural preservation, we're going to hang on to that designation with everything that we have, because we believe that we, you know, we need to be in the country, not annexed into the city. So that's, that's 
the work that's in front of us now is to explore all those possibilities and, and to fix it that someday, you know, we will, someday we'll have to turn it over. So we'll, we'll need to be prepared for that. But it should be, should be a little while. We're not that old. <laughs> How did your animals uh, respond to the tremendous amount of rain that we had? Because that's um, so unusual here. I know. Well, the goats seem to be okay. The, the goats are like, you know, let us out so we can get some, something to eat. We'll be okay. But the chickens, yeah, they didn't lay as many eggs when they were trotting along in, you know, kind of soggy, <laughs> soggy chicken coop. Um, but thank goodness they didn't have to go anywhere. You know, we had friends who had to move their chickens. Actually, we have friends who lost their chickens. So that was just another reason to try to stick around if we could, because what do you do if you have to leave your farm? Do you let your chickens out and risk that predators will get them, or do you leave them in and you know, hope that you get back there before they, they need some food? So luckily, our, and our, our cat, Lucky, she hangs out in the barn anyway. So she didn't come out for a couple days because she doesn't like to get her paws wet. <laughs> but then she showed up at the milk house again, which is where we feed her. She seemed okay. Well, thank you all again for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, maybe it stopped raining. I don't know. Is anybody looking outside? We're just going to go out and have some more moisture out there. Be thankful for it. We will need it at some point. So thank you all for coming.